some of you are uh, MS2s, uh, hopefully I primed your pump with a little bit of vampires and werewolves and, and zombie stuff earlier. Uh, if you're not an MS2, I'm going to introduce uh, Brian Hanrahan and MS4. Uh, we, we unsuccessfully tried to start a zombie appreciation club uh, several months ago. Um, so uh, we decided just to put on at least two Halloween-based lectures uh, about something we both like. So I got to do mine earlier, and, and I'm going to have Brian that come up. Kind of as an academic and teaching elective thing. Uh, so we wanted to put something together, have fun on Halloween, and, and uh, we uh, decided to put this together. So um, thank you uh, for coming out. Uh, Brian, you want to... Uh, Take the, take the microphone. Hello, everybody. Uh, this work? Hello? No. How about now? Now? Yeah. Loud enough? All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Glad to see other people have appreciation for, for this, like I do. Um, before I get started, I have no conflicts of interest. I don't have any investments <laughs> in AMC, Max Brooks, or... Uh, World War Z. Um, I don't want to sell short some of the diseases I'm going to talk about today. Uh, a lot of these things I am going to talk about is correlating human disease to what you would see in the zombie brain. Uh, and the goal is really to combine the two and see what you would really see in a zombie in the real world. Uh, and some of these videos are a little graphic, a little gory, so if you are a little queasy, I'm surprised you can begin with. Um, so why zombies? When I was a kid, I, one of the first movies I saw about zombies was Dawn of the Dead, and I was in grammar school or middle school, and I was really interested about why the zombies acted the way they did, why they walked the way they walked, why they had infatuation with eating people, uh, and what kind of infectious disease would cause something like this. And you know, in my naive state at that age, I really had no idea how I could answer that question. But over the last four years, I've gained a lot of information about human physiology, how things work, and I was really able to apply a lot of that knowledge into what I would think the zombie brain would look like, as well as zombie physiology. Um, if you did a zombie search on PubMed, you'd get about 48 articles. I wanted to look again to see if any more were published during this Halloween uh, week, but I forgot to do so. Uh, the first publication was in 1972. Almost half of these articles were published in the past three years. So the idea of using this pop culture reference as an educational or um, learning tool is really only becoming to be utilized. Um, the American Red Cross is starting to use this zombie idea in preparing people for disasters regardless of the zombie apocalypse, or if it's for you know, disaster preparedness regardless of it's a flood or a hurricane or whatever, whatever else. And the CDC has also kind of jumped on the boat and doing the exact same thing. Um, but before I get into the neuroanatomy aspect of my talk, I'm going to talk about a, few couple, uh, a couple of zombie myths that uh, I'm really bothered by, and you know, it really doesn't make sense when you really look at it. So, this is kind of the first one. Oh, I have to make sure the volume works. So this is one of the first movies where zombies started becoming infatuated with brains. This actually was the first one that actually ever said it. Uh, the very beginning movies, the, the Night of the Living Dead, the one, you know, that black and white film where you see the, the ghouls walking around. Zombie, the term wasn't even actually used in that movie. Uh, more like the Living Dead. Um, so because of that, you know, it's hard for me to believe that zombies really have an infatuation with the human brain. Uh, so this is kind of my first myth. Zombies don't really love brains. Now, this doesn't really make sense. One is because uh, there's a real hard time to get into the brain, to actually, uh, to break the skull and actually get into the brain. Uh, human jaw pressure is about 120 pounds. You can see that uh, correlating to a bunch of other uh, animals here. It's not really quite strong. Um, but how can you know what jaw pressure is really needed to break into the human skull? Well, there was actually a study done uh, a couple of years back. And the goal of this study is really to compare how functional uh, bicycle helmets are preventing skull fractures. And they had a control group, which was uh, cadaver human skulls versus helmeted cadaver skulls. And pretty much what they did was, you can see right here, it's, uh, pretty much just put it in a vice and just, for lack of a better word, crushed it. And uh, 
the result of it was that they broke about, uh, took about 520 pounds of pressure to break into the human skull uh, without the helmet. Uh, I'm just going to skip that, uh, that video, but it was actually a promotional video warning children to wear bicycle helmets and this vice actually crushing the skull into a billion little pieces, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, so with that said, if you look back at the, the jaw pressure uh, figure I had before, I assume zombies have about a comparable jaw pressure. I know I really can't know for sure, but you know, zombie lions would have a really good time getting, uh, getting into the, the, the human brain. So zombies really can't get there. <laughs> <laughs> the second idea is that zombies are able to uh, survive, you know, after decapitation, and that's kind of my biggest problem with the movie of the show, The Walking Dead. Uh, you know, you cut off the head uh, and still looking around, talking, trying to bite. I mean, not talking. I'll get into that later. Um, but this is this doesn't really make sense to me. You know, the human brain requires about 20% of the cardiac output in the body, and requires a significant amount of energy for the amount of tissue that it actually is. Uh, the idea that this can survive without having a, a vascular blood supply just doesn't make sense to me. We are, um, you know, we're anaerobic organisms, require 36 ATP from a mitochondria, which require oxygen. Without these things, you know, we rely only on anaerobic metabolism, and there's no uh, eukaryotic organism that I know can, can survive in that nature. The third myth I really believe in is that uh, there's this idea that, you know, zombies are just you know, resilient. You see these, you know, without arms, without legs, they'll keep coming after you. They'll have, you know, hideous scars and marks and uh, parts of their bones missing, muscles missing, and despite all this, they're still able to come for you. Uh, being infected with, with a zombie disease, regardless of the vector, would make me think that you're actually immunocompromised. Um, <laughs> and actually, because of this, you know, this doesn't make sense. You know, how is this zombie able to survive without a lower half of the body rib cage open without being infected? You know, there's other bacterial uh, vectors in play regardless of what the infectious disease is. And you know, this doesn't make sense that this has a long uh, longevity that you would see in uh, a couple of the movies that are out there and movie, uh, shows as well. So this is a scene from The Walking Dead and in the attempt to try and describe what the, the human brain actually uh, looks like. Is that a brain? An extraordinary one. It invades the brain like meningitis. The adrenal glands hemorrhage, the brain goes into shutdown, then the major organs. Starts the brain? No, just the brain stem. Basically, it gets them up and moving. But they're not alive. You tell me. It's nothing like before. Most of that brain is dark. Dark, like just dead. The frontal lobe, the neocortex, the human part, that doesn't come back. The you part. Just a shit. First of all, I don't know what type of imaging they're using. <laughs> I, I've never seen anything like this before. You know, maybe there's something really nice at the center of disease control that we're unaware of. Uh, but regardless, this this concept is really good for you know team B and for the, the normal person you can to, uh, understand. But this just isn't realistic. And uh, for the next you know half hour or so, I'm going to actually explain what you would actually see in the zombie brain. A lot of what we know, or think we know, about the zombie brain has been brought to the line of other people. So I'm kind of standing on the shoulders of giants. Not a lot of these ideas that I'm bringing up today are actually my own. Um, one of the people that are actually uh, very uh, involved in this, this idea is Steven Solzman. He's a doctor at Harvard Medical School, a psychiatrist there. And he wrote a book called The Zombie Autopsies. And in this book, self-explanatory, uh, is a book where uh, one of the doctors are infected and he's trying to figure out what's going on in this disease. Uh, to prevent his eventual change to becoming a zombie. Uh, there's also a group called the Zombie Research Society. Uh, if you go on the website, it's actually quite impressive the amount of information they have there and the actual people that are involved on the board. A lot of doctors, a lot of researchers, a couple of people within the, the, the field, uh, 
that's in the pop culture field as well. Uh, and again, a lot of the pictures and a lot of the ideas that I'm using is actually based on those. The disease state that's actually described by, uh, by Dr. Solzman is ANSD, the ataxic neurodegenerative satiety deficiency syndrome. And you know, it does a pretty good job of explaining what the zombie disease is. You know, ataxic representing their gait, the neurodegenerative, the actual act of their disease, and the deficiency of satiety, which is another part of the, the presentation of the zombie. So at this point, I'll kind of go into the first thing, lesion that you actually see in the zombie brain. Obviously, you can see this woman is very, very angry. Um, so, what what kind of lesion would this person have where they have an over aggressive um, circuitry? Uh, this is a very crude representation in the brain. I don't really like it, but for this conversation, it's actually will do a good job. Here in the middle, you have the amygdala, which is kind of the emotional center or your anger center of your brain. And this interacts with your hypothalamus and your periapical gray. And you see the, the frontal cortex is also. Uh, being involved in this process as well. Uh, again, this is more of like a, it's more of an interaction between the two. It's not a direct arrow. Uh, the frontal cortex does have a large role uh, in controlling the amygdala, and you, when you uh, keep kind of keeping it in check, telling you that's probably not the best reaction to have at this time. Uh, and what we like to think that occurs in this disease is that the frontal lobe is, is disinhibited or, or uh, damaged, and because of this, you'll have an overactive amygdala or anger center of your brain. This will lead to your hypothalamus being overactive, creating an increased fight or flight response, as well as your periaqua gray, which is involved in your stress or fear response. A good case presentation that kind of uh, describes this type of lesion is with Phineas Cage. Um, has a, a lot of you have heard of this guy before? So, long story short, he's a, he's a works for the railroad, he packs dynamite into the mountains, and when one day while sticking the, the, that pipe right here into the dynamite, the dynamite actually exploded, the pipe went through his skull. And you can see in that picture right there. And despite being an error of an, uh, no antibiotics, he made a fairly remarkable recovery. He had no uh, motor or sensory defects. Obviously, you can see his, um, his eye was affected. But um, long story short, he made a pretty much full recovery, except for one thing, is that his personality changed. Um, he was really obnoxious. He didn't work well with others before that. Apparently, he was a very, very nice man. When it was all said and done, he actually uh, got fired from his job at the railroad company. He worked for the circus for a while, and he had that pipe, and he walked around with it. Um, and that's kind of his story. And looking back on the, uh, the story of this guy, it seems like his uh, change in personality has been over-exaggerated, actually. Um, but regardless, this has kind of been used as a case to describe what a frontal lobe lesion would uh, cause, and, and that is a change in personality. Um, so as I mentioned before, if the frontal cortex is impaired, you'll have this overriding amygdala uh, system working through, involved with the hypothalamus and periapical gray. And people within this field want to call this a crocodile brain, or, or what's considered a primitive brain. Now, I don't really like this description. Uh, from my research, there's no uh, novel, like, comparable area in the crocodile brain called the amygdala, uh, despite as many Google searches I did. So, uh, again, you can see that the cerebellum is largely, you know, comparable size to a lot of the more primitive brain structures of the crocodile. Uh, but, you know, I don't think it's a great description of what you would see in the zombie brain. And moving on to the second part of my talk is, we talked about the frontal lobe being lesion, but I kind of wanted to go into the talk of why they walk the way they do. And um, in here, you know, it's not a perfect description, but you can see these guys walking around. I like to think this is more of a cerebellar ataxic gait comparison to a couple of the other uh, gates that you would see uh, that are uh, abnormal. Um, there's many theories about why uh, the zombie walks the way they do. One idea is that the rigor mortis sets in, and because of this rigor mortis, uh, they're not able to move their joints. There's an idea that they have low energy, so they're not able to move around as actively as they want to. But being this is a neural flexure, I'm going to talk about the possible neural aspect of it. This is the idea that their cerebellum is uh, dysfunctional or ataxic. Now, there's a lot of other disease states that, that show this. If you have a large uh, posterior uh, circulation stroke, you can have bilateral uh, cerebellar lesions. Uh, if you have uh, any congenital, see Danny Walker and uh, Arnold Chiari malformations. 
as well. You can see in this MRI, this child here has almost no cerebellum at all. And here uh, is a video of uh, a child with, uh, with no cerebellum and his attempts to do a couple of different walks. So 
Now, whenever you see something like this, you know, run away, run far as you can, and then eventually they'll forget about you. you know, this kind of goes into the next part. Now, zombies aren't able to form new memories, but what about their old memories? Are they able to go back and, and recognize somebody for who they were um, before they changed? Um, or are they even able to recognize who they are if they look in a mirror? Uh, a good psychologic disease that kind of relates to this is cap rest delusion. Uh, this is comparable to seeing in the movie called uh, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And the idea of this, uh, this disease is where you recognize people, uh, they're familiar to you, but you believe that they have been replaced by someone else. So you, you can see your mom or your girlfriend or your best friend and be like, that looks like my best friend, but looks like my mom, but you're not my mom. So what type of lesion or, or, or uh, you would see in this? Uh, the idea is that the fusiform gyrus right here is largely involved in facial recognition. So that's, you know, it interacts with the occipital lobe where it gathers primary visual information, gets transferred to the fusiform gyrus, and the fusiform gyrus goes, all right, that's my mom. And then the fusiform gyrus also interacts with the amygdala, which I mentioned before in a different disease state, um, saying this is the emotional relationship I have with this person with this, these facial features. So the fusiform gyrus is important in recognizing faces for uh, identity, but that interaction between the fusiform gyrus and the amygdala is very important for the emotional aspect of that relationship. So because of that, it would largely make sense if the fusiform gyrus was involved. Now, it's not really sure if the fusiform gyrus is going to be affected or the interaction between the fusiform gyrus and the amygdala uh, are, are affected. But either way, the zombie doesn't, isn't going to stop when they are trying to eat you. Um, another concept related to this is mirror neurons. Now, this is a theory. Uh, it's not really been uh, really sought after, and not everyone really agrees with this. But there's an idea of, of that um, if you observe someone doing an act, and you doing the act as well, there's an area in the brain that gets excited regardless of that. So if you see someone drinking a beer at uh, Chuck's, and you drink yourself a beer at Chuck's, you're, the same area in your brain is going to be excited. Uh, and this area is... They're not really sure what the role of these, these areas are, but one idea or concept is that this is involved in uh, empathy, emotions, and recognizing self from others. Um, so, you know, if you see someone crying, this area might get excited and you might get emotional as well. Moving on to the next part of my talk. This is my best friend. He's got an inner monologue. By best friend, I mean we occasionally grunt and stare awkwardly at each other. We even have almost conversations sometimes. Days pass this way. Obviously, they're not really able to get out the words that they want to say. Um, although this sounds more like uh, a broca's aphasia, where they're not able to put the words together to represent how they feel, I really don't think zombies have this inner monologue or have the urge to really verbalize anything for that matter. Because of that, I think uh, the atastic neuro, the, uh, neurogenitive satiety deficiency syndrome uh, would have more of a global aphasia affecting both the broca's and one of these areas. Hey, Herschel, man, let me ask you something. Did a living, breathing person, did they walk away from this? Stop spinning around to the chest. Because someone who's alive, can they just take that? Why is it still coming? <laughs> Another interesting part of the zombie body is that they're able to be uh, resilient and, and regardless of pain. Even if they lost a limb, they still uh, are walking after you. If they lost part of their body, uh, regardless of that injury, they don't really seem to be affected by this. Um, so this really leads to uh, something being affected with the sensory system. Uh, most importantly, probably the, the pain sensory system of the body. And kind of the lesion that I think would be going wrong with the, with the brain is more likely related to the nociceptors up to the brain. Uh, we took classes with Dr. Bertino. One of the things he wants to teach us is uh, localize the lesion. So we're going to start the brain and work our way down. Is it brain? Is it brain stem? Is it spinal cord? Is it... Uh, is it um, our nerve, etc. Um, and since I'm talking about a central nervous disease, I want to think that these actual uh, defects are actually in 
the central nervous system, or most importantly, the cerebellum, uh, cerebrum. So as you know, pain gets sent through the nociceptor, crosses about one or two vertebral levels uh, above where it gets into the brain stem, uh, goes all the way up and goes to the somatosensory cortex. And this area is actually also involved with you know, light touch and vibration. Uh, but pain also goes to two other areas as well, through the amygdala. Again, it's the third time I brought this uh, area of the brain up. Uh, the cingulate cortex and the insular cortex. So these areas are, are more involved with the pain aspect of, of feeling more than the, the primary uh, somatosensory areas. The cingulate cortex is believed to be involved in processing conflict or the actual uh, what to do when you are feeling that painful stimulus. And the insula is more involved with the emotional aspect of, uh, oh, this is painful, maybe relating to past painful experiences. Uh, because, of those, because of that, it's not uh, arguable to believe that the cingulate and the insula areas are involved in the zombie brain. Um, I also like to think the primary somatosensory areas are normal because they are able to feel things. Uh, they are able to walk. Um, they don't really have uh, decreased proprioception. Uh, as you would see, you know, in diabetics with it, with uh, issues in their feet or anything like that. But possible is uh, the secondary somatosensory cortex, which you know I didn't don't know too much about, but I believe it's involved more in uh, more complex understandings of the of, of, of sensory uh, innervation uh, might be affected as well. So, kind of talking about before about not feeling pain and being resilient and keep going after you know the body that they're interested in. Uh, zombies are very one-track minded, uh, and a, a similar disease that kind of relates to that is Balan syndrome. Uh, this is seen in people that have traumatic brain injuries or bilateral lesions to uh, areas that believe in the parietal lobe, uh, and this really affects their visual spatial uh, abilities. So if I'm looking at uh, a cluttered desk uh, and a person with this syndrome was uh, asked to see, uh, tell them what you see, uh, he would be able to only uh, concentrate on one part of that whole cluttered desk, like a pen. Or a paper clip. And then if he wanted to see what else was on the table, he would look at something else, look at the pen, and everything on that other everything else on that desk would disappear. So they have a very limited ability of concentrating in the broad view of things. This can be seen here. fireworks and really can't do anything else because of this distraction and almost become frozen, almost like a deer in headlights. Uh, let's not go there. <laughs> That's why I'm only picking the, the parts that are cor correlating to my story. <laughs> um, the next concept is the, this addiction to eating flesh. I didn't spend too much time on this because I don't really like many of the theories that are out there relating to this. Um, there are parts in the brain that are related to um, increased urge to do things, uh, primarily um, within the reward pathway with, involved with the nucleus of humans and the eventual tegmentum. Um, so people like to think that the people with the zombie brine have the same addictive uh, personalities as someone that would be addicted to heroin or cocaine. Uh, you know, eating someone actually releases a huge dopamine response and it feels good and then they want to do it again. And if you see someone else doing that, eating another person, that dopamine uh, response is going to be there as well. Um, I don't know how this, how good this is. I don't know how you could make a zombie more interested in eating someone as opposed to you know, doing something else. So I don't think this fully explains the, the, the interest of the zombie uh, for the human body. And the last part of the talk is actually the insatiable appetite. And this, I think, is a better description of what's going on. Uh, the hypothalamus, as I mentioned before, is hyperactive in the zombie, which leads to increased fight or flight or stress response, you know, increased catecholamines. Um, but there's also a lot of other uh, things in the hypothalamus that are important. And the two areas that are involved are the lateral hypothalamic area and the ventral medial area. And these areas are involved in feeding and satiety. Uh, you can see right here the area involved. So if you had uh, lesions to the ventral medial nucleus, uh, you have an increased uh, urge to eat things. 
Um, this can be seen in a mouse right here that actually had a lesion to this area where he kept eating and became very obese as compared to the normal mouse. Uh, so the areas in this, in this uh, nucleus are actually very responsive to glucose in the body. So what happens is you take a bite to eat, you know, you digest that food, the sugar gets into your uh, bloodstream, that glucose is recognized by the ventromedial nucleus, the ventromedial nucleus tells your brain, all right, you had enough to eat, There's, I'm getting sugar, everything's good. Um, and obviously if that area is impaired, you know, you're not going to have that response to stop eating. Um, so you'd like to think that zombies also have this area involved because they, you know, despite you know having a full body in front of them that they can eat, uh, they might just keep going and going and going. There's some, you know, cases of zombies with huge bellies or um, maybe even part of their stomach uh, protruding or, or perforated, and the food's coming out of their stomach and then they're picking it back up and eating it again. Um, so I think that can explain it. So long story short, those are kind of all the main lesions that I think you would see in the zombie brain. Um, and I'll go over them all quickly right now. Uh, the frontal lobe is, dis, uh, is dysfunctional, leading to a more primary, uh, more primary action by the zombie. The cerebellum is involved, leading to more cerebellar gait. Uh, the bilateral hippocampal gyri are lesion, leading to the inability to form new memories, which is why it's good to run away from zombies because then they'll forget they're chasing you. Uh, the fusiform gyrus, or maybe the fusiform gyrus uh, uh, areas connecting that to the amygdala are going to be affected, so they're not able to recognize spaces as people. Um, and possibly mirror neurons that are involved with uh, apathy and empathy. There's a global aphasia, they're not able to uh, express words. I believe that their vocal cords are uh, intact, you know, they are able to moan and do some things like that, but they're not really able to put many words together. Um, the insula and cingulate uh, gyri, which are involved in more complex uh, comprehension of pain or, or damage. The ventral medial and uh, the ventral medial areas and the hypothalamus are going to be damaged, leading to a hyper uh, orality or an increased urge to eat. And the reward pathway is going to be hyperactive, leading to the compulsive urge to keep doing something in this regard. So um, what you can see here is you know, some of the lesions. If this was a, an fMRI of the zombie brain, you see cerebellum is involved. Um, frontal lobe is, is smaller, and a couple of other things. And here, down here, you can see more um, axial cuts um, of the human brain. The, the human brain is the one in gray, and overlaid on top that is what you would see in the zombie brain. Again, cerebellum is involved, frontal lobe is involved, uh, cingulate area. Uh, well, the insula, I'm sorry, and the cingulate areas as well. Um, although this is only the zombie brain, I think there's a couple of other cool things to think about. Now, what are the possible infectious qualities, uh, infectious ideologies uh, of causing something like this? Dr. Schwartz spoke about it a little bit today. A lot of people think it possibly is a virus, and I agree that's probably the most likely idea, but there's a lot of other parasitic causes, bacterial causes. Taxoplasma migani affects the human brain, it affects human function. Um, what public health changes would happen if, if there's a zombie apocalypse, how would we prevent that and spread of that? Uh, and what other organ systems would be affected in the zombie brain? Uh, zombie physiology, you know, how would the GI system work, to, you know, digesting only proteins? How would the cardiovascular system be affected? Because you, I mentioned before, you still need to supply the brain with other aspects of the body. So with that said, that's pretty much the end of my talk. Um, I don't want you to be like these guys right here. So now after this talk, I don't want you to be like this guy and be completely oblivious to the things around me and the things ever went awry. Papers. Now, sir, 
Tony. Why are you at 15 p?